Well, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How Good Innovation Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the next hour of discussion. Um, as a way of introducing one another, if our audience members would like to put their name and where they're based, um, if you'd like, you can put your role or the company where you work into the chat, and we can get to know each other a little bit that way, even though we won't have time to formally introduce ourselves to one another. Um, my name is Leah Wolf. I am currently in Brooklyn, New York. It's a beautiful day here. Um, and I'm the head of regenerative education and content here at How Good. I'm really excited to be speaking with our two panelists today. We'll discuss the direct line from sustainability transparency to dollar signs and the lifts from their perspective on coordinating ESG reporting. Today, we'll be speaking with Brian Nash, who is the VP of Corporate Sustainability at Ingredion. And we're also joined by Philomena Rinaldi, who is the Senior Sustainability Co Consultant for Simrise AG. Uh, I just want to let you know about some of our upcoming events. Um, the next session in our series will be next Thursday, November 17th at the same time, so 1 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be speaking with Anna Hawkins from CDP, as well as Rob Myers, the VP of Sustainable Agriculture and Global Sustainability at PepsiCo, um, about developing sustainability reporting standards, which have become industry and market norms. And finally, our agenda for today, we'll finish up our introduction. We'll have a 40 to 45 minute conversation with our panelists. And as we continue with our discussion today, I'd like to invite the audience to put any questions that you might have for our speakers into the chat. And I will do my best to get to them and relay them to our panel. Uh, so without further ado, I, I'd like to hand it over to our panelists to give a quick introduction of themselves. Um, you can talk a little bit about your background, your role, maybe a bit about your sustainability journey and what brought you uh, to what you're working on today. Um, Brian, if you wanna get us started, that would be wonderful. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Brian Nash, um, as, as you already saw in the previous slide, uh, Vice President of Corporate Sustainability for Ingredion, um, which is a Fortune 500 ingredient manufacturer, mostly supplying into the food and beverage industry. Um, yeah, how, how did I get to my role? I mean, I've, I've been in sustainability for 15 years. Um, and I think back then it was, it was pretty new in the organization. Um, I did some research and presented to, um, you know, a strategy meeting of about 150 leaders in the company on sustainability. And at lunch, our CEO said to me, what do you think we should do first? And I said, you should probably make it a, you know, a department with, you know, formal deliverables and everything. And he said, okay, you're in charge of it. What do you think we should do first? Um, so that, that's how, that's how I got my job 15 years ago in, in this field. Um, you know, in 2020, Ingredion launched our new 2030 all life plan, um, which for us, we don't have a roadmap on how to, to do all the things that are in there. Um, but we just agree that it's where we need to directionally go as a company over the next 10 years. And, and so that's that's part of my, you know, my role, a big part of it is um, integrating that those sustainability deliverables and goals into the organization, um, aligning with partners, uh, internal and external to make sure that we're executing on that and ultimately driving value for ingredient and in our stakeholders. Wow, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Philomena, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Leah, and uh, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been um, working in Simrise in the sustainability department for the last five years, and this is my first job in sustainability. I'm a nutritionist by education, but even more important, um, my background uh, has been marked by the fact that I, um, my four grandparents, they were all farmers. So the passion for food and for nature runs in the family. And this is why I started studying uh, nutrition. And then progressively, I realized that uh, if we look beyond or behind what's, uh, what's in our plates, uh, there's a, a there's a lot and very challenging work uh, waiting for us to take action. So um, five years ago, I um, I joined Simrise, which is one of the uh, global leaders in the flavor and fragrance industries. 
uh, we, you will see we are a company with a strong uh, vocation and commitment on sustainability. And that, that is what uh, made me uh, leave Italy, where I've been uh, living and working for big organizations like Ferrero, that I'm, I guess you know, and um, Unilever before Ferrero. So definitely the journey in sustainability is a continuous learning for everyone in, in, this, in this area. And uh, I'm glad today to be here and be able to share and exchange uh, with you what I've been learning uh, over, the, over the time. Thank you so much. Um, both of you touched briefly on the sustainability work and goals that each of your organization has currently. Um, I wonder if you could each share an initiative that you're most proud of, um, that you've worked on and or collaborated on, or that your organization at large is focused on right now. Um, and Brian, if you want to start us off again, that would be that would be great. Um, yeah, well, there, there's a there's a lot of them, right? Um, I think one one of the things uh, that that our company has worked on that I haven't worked on, which is why I'm proud of it. There's a lot of sustainability initiatives that I've put out there, but um, our, our uh, European business actually is collaborating with some partners in Africa um, on a nutritional uh, drink for children in schools and, and looking at how they bring nutrition to those, those children. So I think it's kicked off in Kenya this year with um, you know nutrition being brought to four, I think 400,000 kids and looking to expand that next year to, to over 2 million um, school kids. And I, and I know that the schools where they put the programs are now uh, at full capacity for you know, enrollment um, because parents want their kids to go where, where they're going to get you know, fed during the day. Um, and, and like I said, I, I didn't work directly on that. So I'm, I'm proud that sustainability is now at the point in our organization where people are kind of really internalizing that and, and bringing it in, into the roles and uh, really looking at how we can we can serve our communities while also growing our business for the company. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to, and this is certainly Halgood's point of view as well, um, to consider sustainability more holistically, right? And not just based on environmental impact, but also on, on social impact. So I think that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Philomena, do you have something in mind that you'd like to share that you're proud of at your at at, at Simrise? Yes, I do, and uh, by by chance, it is very similar to to what uh, Brian has just presented to us. This is a big program that we are driving with multiple uh, projects under this umbrella. It is called Bridging the Gap. And we are very proud of it because it is a long term. Ten years is the timeline in front of us, so it's a long term private public uh, partnership that we are driving with the German uh, Department for International Development. So what we are doing is we are engaging with our big um, suppliers and big customers in multiple regions on different crops. So the flagship project, uh, project would be Vanilla in Madagascar, but we have um, initiatives also in the Amazon with uh, some botanicals. Uh, we do have uh, two uh, projects, one in India for mint and another one uh, in the Philippines for coconut. So this is really a global program and the aim is to work closely and directly with our farming communities um, implementing sustainable agricultural practices that of course will have benefits for the quality, for the uh, footprint, but also for the social uh, dimension, because of course uh, we, we want to empower the next generation of farmers to make a living out of agriculture, to stay in agriculture and to make it uh, a professional area where uh, specific skills are developed and are used in order to um, deliver the best that we can uh, at field level. So um, not surprisingly, when there is a human dimension within a project, it's, uh, it's much easier to feel proud and to feel uh, deeply involved. So uh, that's from my side. Yeah, absolutely. And I think <clears throat> in, in my work at How Good so far, I, I am constantly surprised at when you make improvements to one sort of dimension of sustainability, often you get to see positive outcomes in other 
areas as well as a result. Um, and so it sounds like both of you are are seeing that happen in, in those initiatives, which I think is wonderful. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit of this, uh, this session is obviously called Leaders in Climate Reporting. Um, and so I'd like to ask each of you how your organization is thinking about the coming decade in terms of environmental impact regulations that are likely to come, the sustainability work that you're already doing, and sort of what that feedback loop might look like regarding different stakeholders, such as your customers and maybe investors. Um, so kind of how all that is playing together and, and impacting your, your next decade at Ingredion and Simrise. Um, Brian, are you, are you excited to take this one on? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's an interesting question, right? Because we have more stakeholders than I can count. And, and I would say since probably 2019, but it was really, I think, heightened in the pandemic, we, we've seen a, a lot more engaged stakeholders. We had a lot of stakeholders before. The number of them that are reaching out and engaged and have specific questions or specific asks has, has increased dramatically. And, and so I, I think it, it only um, strengthens the path we've chosen to take, which is an ingredient. We've always said that when we set programs or standards, we will base them on externally um, viable standards or programs that are out there, right? So for, for sustainable agriculture, for example, we have a lot of customers that have their own sustainable agriculture code or, or program. We've chosen to go with Sci Platform, um, which is probably one of the leading sustainable ag groups in the food and beverage space, and use that as our default, right? So that's that's what we work to globally. If a customer comes to us and wants something in addition to that, then we make that a commercial discussion. Um, and and so that's how we we always treat stakeholder input as being valuable um, because it's pointing us to trends. It's so it's valuable information that we mine and we track and we analyze. But at the end of the day, um, I, I'd be like a cork, you know, I would say like be like a cork in a stormy ocean if if we didn't have kind of our own North Star or something externally that we were aligned with. Um, and, and we suffered from that early on in our sustainability program. You know, we had early on in maybe 2011, we started seeing three or four customers coming to us saying, do our sustainable ag program or, you know, we need you to be aligned with this. Um, and, and we kind of spun our wheels for a few years until we aligned with Sci Platform and then we started making progress. I see that strategy really paying off now because if we think about science-based targets and the number of customers that come to us with their unique ask, I want to do this on a farm or I want you to procure all renewable energy to make my products or my ingredients, it, it's the requests are, are far-reaching and very different. And, and so if we tried to just please every customer, regardless of how important or strategic they are, uh, it would be a losing battle. And, and so, so like I said, we were constantly seeking feedback from our investors, from our, um, you know, from our customers. We also talk to NGOs to kind of calibrate, okay, what, what, what do you really think we should be doing from an outside in perspective? Um, but at the end of the day, we default back to our program. And then we look to build on top of that where we see there being, you know, a strategic value in growth for the company. Yeah, and I wonder also, um, just to dig a little bit into something that you said that I, I think I'd like to kind of tease out a bit more in terms of, you know, in the early days of sustainability strat strategy, um, thank you for your candor also on uh, on some of the struggles and the challenges that can take place in those early days of of trying to strategize around becoming more sustainable or working toward regenerative. Um, I guess there are several organizations that are working to sort of unify um, different standards, different certifications, different methods. And do you see a real need for that, maybe from the ingredient perspective or maybe from the sector at large to have a more unified source of truth when it comes to sustainability and sustainability, sustainable agriculture at large? Yeah, I would say for sustainability in general, uh, speaking on behalf of the you know, B2B suppliers out there, the more things are standardized, the easier it is um, to get things done. 
And, and I think what you're competing against in standardization is that companies are seeing double digit growth from their sustainable brands or products. And, and so it's really hard to say, I want to differentiate to drive growth, but then I'm going to align to a common standard that all my competitors are using as well. And, and that's the struggle we see is we've got a lot of customers that are members of AIM Progress and say, okay, as a member of AIM Progress, we'll accept you know, SEDEX or a SMETA audit for, for human rights or ethical sourcing. But then they come in and they say, hey, we think for this brand, we could really do something unique. And if we dig into your supply chain in this way, and and so I think that's the balance, right? Is is where where do you serve the kind of individual request, and and then where do you default to standardization? From from my standpoint, standardization makes everything easier. If everybody was on a level playing field, it'd be a lot simpler to get things done because I know what to expect from every stakeholder. Um, in reality, I, I don't see that happening, and so you know that forces us to do things like segment customers. Um, to look at, okay, who are the ones we strategically want to go on these extra journeys with and and to what degree? Yeah. Um, Philomena, I'd love to hear from you uh, about what the next 10 years at Simrise looks like and and kind of how Simrise is thinking about the the next decade of regulations and increased consumer and investor demand for transparency and full on reporting. <laughs> of course. And if you allow me, I, I'd like also to spend a few words on the on the past 10 years, because again, uh, back to one of the points that uh, was that were raised by uh, Brian, I think external motivations like the expectation of our uh, investors or the upcoming regulation uh, is something important to drive sustainability, but cannot be the main reason for, for an organization to go in that direction. So uh, when I look back at my organization, uh, what I see is that already 10 years ago, even more, we started the journey, for example, with SEDEX or um, with uh, our uh, farming communities in some specific regions. Already uh, over uh, five years ago, we started the journey with CDP uh, on carbon reporting. We started the engagement with the, uh, with the um, uh, science-based target initiative. So it is very important for every organization, I think, and even for SimRise, to keep in mind that internal motivation remains the most important one. Let's say the pull factor is more important than the push factor that is uh, coming from the outside. At the same time, I see some big value in the, for example, in the requirements of the regulation. And the, the, the value is somehow um, to um, standardize because um, we need, uh, from our perspective as suppliers, some kind of standardization, uh, also to pre prevent uh, that some players might um, I don't know, greenwash or might um, be tempted to overstate uh, their uh, results or their commitment. Also, I think regulation is important for ourselves as, as organization to uh, optimize and to, uh, to really uh, sharpen our approach because based on uh, strict figures uh, and specific numbers, we can um, orient our action, we can prioritize, for example, in terms of resources or in terms of priorities, um, uh, in terms of time. Uh, so um, there is uh, a need for more harmonized and standardized regulations, although they will remain a, a, an aid not surely the purpose or uh, what really uh, is, is making things um, evolve in the right direction. Absolutely. And I think that you touched on something really important, which is the idea of regulations being sort of a backstop for companies who might take advantage a bit uh, otherwise without the threat of, of litigious and uh, other, you know, financial consequences. But I think it's also, as we're facing a time of economic uncertainty, um, and this is where my question for you comes in, what would you say to an organization that's considering putting um, climate and 
you know, specifically scope three and carbon reporting on the back burner, um, because often that is the first the first thing to be cut when you're trying to kind of tighten the organizational belt. Um, I think that that's one role that regulation can serve is to sort of try to avoid that. But what what would you say to an organization that's saying, OK, let's make cuts in sustainability while we're looking at this time of potential recession? I'm going to put that question to you first, Philomena, and then Brian, if you want to jump in afterward, I'd love to hear your perspective, too. So let, let us do so. Uh, well, the, the first um, uh, the first uh, thing that I'd say is that the hidden cost of not doing anything uh, is higher than the uh, cost of kicking this off. So again, uh, I know this might sound something obvious. Uh, it is not. And uh, it is not until you go back to your internal motivations again. So what is the real added value of sustainability for the organization? Um, I, um, I think at organizational level, it is very similar to what we experience as humans, individuals. So if you don't know what, why you are doing something and what is really in there for you, you will uh, probably not go that far as you could. And there is a game, for example, that we play in our uh, team, team meetings very often, even with customers or with suppliers. Uh, for example, when we have a new idea, a new project that we want to uh, pilot with some uh, suppliers, processors or farming communities, what we do, uh, we often start the conversation asking ourselves to everyone in the room, what's in there for you as a company and as an individual. So really spending some time on that, uh, on the why, is really uh, what makes the difference in the long term. Because you can, of course, start and then you lose people along the journey. But if they know why they are doing that, again, it's not just for the benefit of the company, it's also for the benefit of themselves. For example, being proud of what they do and being able to tell their children stories regarding their work. Um, so uh, really spending time on that um, and, and, and then realizing that uh, there is something which, uh, which can really um, be relevant uh, and not simply, um, let's say, um, addressing an external demand. Yeah, and I think um, the why, I love the way that you phrase that, the why, right? And I think that from a, a higher level perspective, organizationally, we see a lot of studies coming out that talk about how Im the importance of moral clarity and motivation for the next generation of workers who are coming in and want their companies, you know, millennials and Gen Z, they really want their companies to represent and align with their values. And so I think from a long-term strategy perspective, um, just based on bringing in and attracting top tier talent, it's really important to have your why um, yeah. and ready to communicate. But I do want to bring it back to the business case also, which is I think that you were saying, you know, it's really important to have this why. What is the business case why for Ingredion? Like what is what is the thing that makes it easy to say to investors or people who are in the C-suite, like, this is why we need to make sure that we're doing this from a financial and business perspective? Yeah, we have we have four value drivers we identified early on in sustainability. And if an initiative doesn't align with one of those value drivers, then we have a serious conversation about whether or not we should be doing the initiative. And, and sometimes we do. Sometimes things aren't aligned with them and we think there's a, another reason for doing it. But, but our four value drivers are first cost control. Um, if I take out, you know, if I reduce my carbon emissions by 10%, I'm take out 10% of my utilities. That represents roughly $50 million of operating expense. It's not a tough sell to tell a CFO, I wanna spend $5 million to save 50 million. Um, and so, so cost control, we look at if we do something, do we make it more efficient, right? If we can help our growers reduce the amount of pesticide or fertilizers, does that then make the crops, you know, less expensive for us to purchase and also, you know, make for a more resilient supply chain? 
Two is, is risk mitigation. I think that gets into agricultural supply, but also things like human rights. What, what are the things that we as a company would never want associated with our business? And, and how do we mitigate those risks? I mean, some of those might be ethical, some of those might be climate related, uh, all of the above. Um, so, so we do things, and, and again, our finance group understands risk, right? They control the enterprise risk management process. It's, it's not hard to go in and say, we do this because you know, we have to mitigate the risk. Um, third one, which is a, a little bit more uh, maybe vague, but is brand enhancement. So is what we're doing going to enhance Ingredion's brand and or the brand of our customer? Um, and so there are things that we do in there that, that are for brand enhancement. That could be uh, sustainable or regenerative agriculture. Somebody wants to brand that into a particular product line. Um, somebody might want a low carbon product line. And, and these things may have far reaching impacts beyond what they're actually marketing. Um, you know, so if you if you do sustainable ag, you're probably also reducing the environmental footprint. Um, so that may not only be able to be something they can market on their brand, but it may support their scope three em emission reduction targets. So we, we see a lot of secondary benefits coming out of brand enhancement work. Um, and then the fourth one, which has already been mentioned, is employee satisfaction. Um, there, there is a big war for talent right now. And a lot of people that we interview were finding very specifically want to work in the food and beverage space and very specifically want to work for a company that they really believe in the purpose of. Um, and so the things that we do in sustainability help us uh, attract and, and retain talent. And those are kind of our four value drivers. We, we default back to those. Um, and then to the previous question about what do you say, what would you say to an executive team that wanted to dial back sustainability in the middle of a pandemic? And and invariably, I always have somebody on our executive team that plays devil ab devil's advocate and says something like that because they want to see if they can, you know, to get me all excited in the meeting or something. But um, look, I would say this, and this is what I've said to our executive team, is nobody, nobody sees leadership quality in a company that, you know, is producing the latest, greatest thing and, and making money, right? I mean, if your business is running as planned, Okay, that's fine. I think where you can really have an opportunity to show leadership as an executive is in adversity. And, and so in the pandemic, we said, do we want to be the company that took advantage of the pandemic to take our foot off the gas on sustainability? Or do we want to demonstrate to our customers and our investors that we really believe in this, that it's integrated in the business strategy and it's full steam ahead? Um, and and don't don't under undervalue the the idea of putting a little bit of a check on on the executive team's ego. Um, because that, that's a selling point. And, and Philomena mentioned it, right? Um, you know, telling them what, what are you trying to do or what are you leaving behind? That's a big driver, I think, for executives in what kind of mark are they leaving on, on the company. So that, that's how that's how we, you know, really focus on on value in terms of sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I I'd be curious, I think that you guys are are probably, I mean, obviously you are leaders in this space. And I think that you are certainly in rooms with other. Um, other industry leaders who are maybe not quite meeting the moment on sustainability in the ways that you are making exerted efforts to do. And so I'd be curious if you think that, you know, you don't have to like name any names, but if you want to talk more broadly about whether you think that the food and beverage space is meeting the moment from an environmental harm reduction perspective, and also from a regulatory preparedness perspective, obviously you are at the leading edge of making sure that you're in a good spot to take on and comply with a lot of these regu incoming regulatory changes. Do you feel like that's something that is a concern across the board? And and you know, do you think people are are being successful in in the attempts that they may be making? Um, yeah, Brian, you go ahead. Yeah. First of all, I'd first of all I'd say I would never call myself a leader. I'd say avid learner in sustainability. Every day somebody asks me something I've never heard of before. So um, a continual learner in sustainability. The only time I use the word leader is in my review. You know, when I'm trying to talk about how much money they should pay me. Um, but but so thank you for that that compliment. Um, you look, I would say the food and beverage space is rising to the occasion in general. Um, and and I. I think we see this for a few reasons. One is you've got companies, I'll, I'll mention the good examples, right? You've got companies like Unilever and Nestle, they're kind of leading the way, but also, you know, their double digit growth strategy is aligned with, you know, brands with a purpose or, or sustainability. 
Um, this is dovetailing in very nicely to the strategy and purchasing look at companies like Walmart. And, and all that does two things. One is it helps drive values down through the supply chain. And then two, companies that are trying to compete with those organizations, particularly smaller or medium-sized companies, know that they have to play in that space to be competitive. And, and so all of that, I think, kind of creates an environment where people are um, are trying to drive toward a more sustainable food system. Um, in terms of regulation, I feel like everybody's kind of keeping their finger on the pulse of, of regulations. Um, you, I mean, you look at like the EU and the, the you know, farm to fork and, and the projection that we'll have, you know, 25% of crops in Europe will be organic. Um, I think everybody's looking at that, right? Is there is there a play in getting there sooner rather than later? What's the organic market look like? What do market insights tell us? Um, and I feel like as people look at sustainability as a competitive advantage, they tend to look at the regulations and the trends a lot more to figure out how to capitalize on the opportunities. Mm, absolutely. And I'm curious, Philomena, what your perspective is on it, if you agree, if you have anything to add, but particularly because you've worked in the European space for for several years and many years. And um, and today, I believe that EU corporate report, sustainable reporting disclosure just went through and will be taking effect in early 2024. And so kind of, I'd love to hear, kind of hear your perspective on this. Yes, uh, definitely. In terms of uh, having uh, sustainability very high in the agenda of everyone, uh, I think the moment I realized that this is uh, now uh, really um, a, a turning point, uh, potentially a turning point, is when one of our biggest customer, uh, one of these uh, leaders, <laughs> and I, I will use this definition for, for them in, in this case, but um, one of these customers, um, they came to us um, asking to uh, look at the portfolio of the solutions that we sell them. And, uh, and they wanted to basically uh, have sustainable solutions instead of natural solutions, which was their previous request only four years ago. So in four years, they did prioritize natural naturalness and they prioritize sustainability in the same portfolio of products. So this was an eye opening for us in in, your, in, in Simrise somehow, also in the marketing and um, and the key account team. Uh, so uh, definitely there is um, at, at the moment a lot of attention. Uh, we need to accelerate though, uh, because uh, we have these big leaders. And we have a lot of players that they, they, that they are trying to follow. For them, it is still difficult, I believe, because uh, we see um, a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance in, in our consumers yet, where they expect sustainability. They are keen to see uh, that a brand has a positive uh, commitment and um, um, really an ethical behavior. At the same time, they still uh, look at uh, other drivers in their food choice as the primary drivers, namely the cost and the taste and the convenience sometimes. So we see that this is uh, growing. Uh, still, we are not at the tipping point, uh, but um, the more uh, players are going in that direction with good results for their brands, the more I think that uh, this will consolidate. Um, so in terms of regulations, the fact that we already have now regulations and many more are coming up in the next years on human rights, on forced labor, on reporting, as you, as you mentioned, uh, for, for EU, uh, we already have um, new uh, requirements for 2024 uh, being a listed company as in RISE. So uh, this is showing, this is proving, proving that sustainability is now um, is here to stay because uh, it is very well known that regulation is not fast to be implemented. So if it, we see now so much effort in this direction is because this is becoming really uh, relevant and we cannot escape, escape anymore. However, as I said, uh, there's a lot going on. We have to accelerate. Um, we have the COP27 going on these days in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh. And I remember 
semester during the last COP26 in Glasgow, I was shocked to hear that someone was questioning if we should keep the target of below 1.5 degree or simply look at two degrees. So this is where we really need to stand <laughs> by our beliefs. It is difficult because of course we see in front of us a lot of challenges. Uh, and so sometimes we can lose confidence. It happens even, I don't know, Brian, I'm, I'm talking for myself, but uh, I've experienced no, some people in sustainability, we tend to have moments where we question ourselves. And I think this is very healthy, but in the end, I don't want to see any step back in terms of regulations or in terms of global commitment, uh, only because we are not achieving what we want right now. Uh, so the trend should be kind of uh, there to stay, in, 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 my, in my opinion, and I think this is what is going to happen, definitely. You're, you're, not, here. you're not alone, Philomena. Um, you know, every day I think, uh, should I have been an accountant? Um, it's yeah. like, it's challenging, right? It's also the fun part of the job. Yeah, and as you bring up accounting, it made me think, I mean, you both have the advantage of working at organizations and having um, seen opportunities to potentially move the goalposts on, on goals, right? When things get tough, Brian, you mentioned during the pandemic, the maybe the Tempt, temptation to to kind of push oh what's what's half a degree Celsius um what is one thing I have so let me regroup here um I just have I could ask you guys 10 different questions I'm really excited I I, I wish we had another hour um so what's one thing that by sticking to those goals, by sticking to your to your guns, so to speak, um, you've seen a real reward on. And I'm thinking specifically, Philomena, when we were talking leading up to this session, um, that Simrai saw some real rewards around supply chain resiliency. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. And then, Brian, if you have something in mind as well, I'd love to hear about that. Sure, uh, definitely. I think that uh, these days supply chain uh, is one of the hot topics for all companies and we all know that uh, some critical raw materials represent really a high risk in terms of uh, availability, disruption or quality uh, price. So having strong uh, partnerships uh, upstream in the, in the value chain uh, has been instrumental for us in, in many, many ways. Uh, so um, we also uh, are able at the moment to, um, for example, we are using the scope tree um, intelligence that we are gaining around our ingredients also to, um, uh, to uh, revise the risk level associated to some ingredients. Um, and we use, um, and, and we are uh, basically working to really map uh, the uh, carbon footprint of our top uh, raw materials, the raw materials that, that represent the 80% of the volume we purchase every year, uh, because we are uh, very much conscious that, uh, for example, even climate change, when we talk of agricultural raw materials, is already a reality and it's already forcing us to reshape our supply chain. Uh, we, are, uh, we are at the moment, uh, this, uh, during these weeks, I'm uh, engaging with uh, suppliers of pitch, new suppliers, simply because uh, our Spanish supplier is not able to deliver anymore the quantity that he provided um, usually because of the warming of the climate. So the production, the yield has gone down, and now we are looking for new suppliers with the same quality. And again, we are now in the stage of implementing with them the CIFSA approach, so that the pitch that we source from them in Italy, in the north of Italy, of course, because in the south, we have the same problem, no availability, the, the climate is too hot. Uh, so again, we are starting now the engagement, and this is uh, somehow slowing us 
So uh, we know very well that for the next crop where we see the risk of uh, climate impacting the yield, we need to prepare in advance. So in, in this uh, learning journey, um, we really now consider the, 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 the environmental data as part of the risk, uh, of the risk evaluation. And this is um, important to prepare for the future and to be ready for the big uh, or um, uh, unexpected changes that um, are related to the current situation. Oh, fantastic. I wonder, Brian, if there's anything, uh, any rewards that you've seen from this, from, from your similar sustainability and carbon mitigation work? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give an example on, on um, water. Uh, although I could I could give you one on carbon, but um, but the water example is a little more dramatic. We we use context based water targets, so we we use five different publicly available water stress tools. We aggregate the results and then we rank all of our sites from low stress to extremely high stress, and then set tiered reduction targets based on where you fall on that scale. And and uh, maybe about a year ago, our operations group came back and said. Okay, Mexico is an extremely high stress water area. They've got these high reduction targets. They're already among the most efficient water users in the company. So they've already done so much work. You're trying, you're now that you're trying to squeeze them, it's going to involve a substantial investment because all the low lying fruit's been picked. And, and so we we had this discussion at the executive team and we said, I said, well, you're not going to get any more growth if you don't get more efficient water use, right? So are you done growing in Mexico? And they said, well, no. And, and so we said, okay, so the company agreed. It's the right thing to do. We have to keep going. Um, earlier this year, our CEO was in a top-to-top -top meeting with one of our biggest customers. And they told him that they are looking to supply locally, but they're also trying to figure out how to mitigate uh, you know, environmental impact in their supply chain. And that they were really impressed that we were making that investment in Mexico. And how could they look to give us a bigger share of wallet and, and have more sales and growth with us going forward to kind of capitalize on that. And I think that was the aha moment for, you know, our CEO, right, to say, okay, we knew it was hard and we chose to do it anyway. And now our customers are acknowledging that um, and, and there's a payoff. I mean, I could say the same thing in plant-based protein where we've got plants that have, you know, a, a small fraction of a carbon footprint because of the way they're, they're operating. And um, we've had, you know, big food companies come to us and say, I'll take I'll take a lot of you know plant-based protein out of that site because it's aligned with with me shifting over to this plant-based space, but also because it's minimizing my scope three footprint. Um, and so that's where we're seeing some of these investments start to pay off. And and then you know once that happens, then the executive team gets you know kind of starry-eyed and and say, oh, what, what should we be doing next? Right? Where should we put more money? Uh, which is a, which is a great problem to have is to try to figure out you know how to answer that question. Wow, that's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's like, I, I think often, especially when we're talking about scope three emissions and climate change, um, it feels like the wins are few and far between. And so I, I really appreciate you sharing those and you as well, Philomena. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit more specifically about scope three and carbon in this next question. Um, in the food and beverage space, Base, even with it, even if someone has a background or interest in sustainability, um, carbon accounting, specifically scope three accounting and reporting, can seem very overwhelming um, and is overwhelming. And especially when you have a global supply system, right, where so much of your total greenhouse gas emissions are coming from a very diverse and very geographically enormous um, supply system. Um, so I wonder if you have any advice or reflections on just taking the first step toward trying to measure and then eventually manage um, some of the scope three reporting that's gonna become legally necessary for many companies in the next few years. Um, and I'll let either of you jump in if you're feeling bold. <laughs> Well, I think the, the word overwhelming is uh, probably an understatement. If you think of uh, our uh, supply chains, in, in our case, in SimRights, we have uh, 30,000 uh, raw materials that we buy, 13,000 suppliers. So this is, uh, this is definitely huge. 
and all you all you can do you can start from somewhere <laughs> so uh, as you say it's uh, it's really to uh, to identify what is the big volume or the big value or the critical raw materials in in your supply chain and to start focusing on on those ones um, uh, the idea in, in our case, for example, we provide uh, flavoring solutions um, so that the percentage product of our customers is very low. Still, uh, this doesn't mean that we cannot uh, make our contribution. I have, um, as I said before, I've been working for Unilever and um, they launched the, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan at, at the time I was there. And the, the motto was um, small actions, big difference. So uh, even if we provide small ingredients uh, and we have so many uh, in our um, in our supply chain, and um, this uh, still there is an opportunity to focus on what can generate the highest uh, impact. Um, so, for example, in our case, our formulations are mainly based in many cases on um, carriers, and we have a lot of projects going on on, um, for example. Um, starch or maltodextrin. Not only, for example, we are looking at different origins, different feedstock, uh, and we see that when we replace uh, maltodextrin, which can be, I don't know, uh, even more than 50% of the final formulation, uh, and we switch, for example, from uh, something which uh, has to come through the ocean to something which is instead produced in the same continent from a different feedstock, maybe, we can save so much uh, carbon, but also we can save so much time, uh, so much cost for ourselves and for our customers. So um, if you look, um, but, but also, for example, still about maltodextrin, what, what we do, um, I, I think um, something very much close to carbon is the idea of the circular uh, model, the circular production model and full, full side stream valorization. If we want to uh, reduce carbon, we have to make the most out of what we have. And for example, we have uh, been investing a lot with, again, a big customer to use the onion pomace, which is the leftover of the uh, process for getting our onion uh, natural flavors. And we use this, uh, this pomace instead of maltodextrin. So we are cutting down waste, we are upcycling, and uh, somehow by working on some critical ingredients, we can see a big difference, as I said, not only in terms of uh, carbon, but then in the end, it, this goes back to cost, to efficiency, to lead time, and to trust from our customers and reputation and um, distinctiveness. So um, it's uh, there's plenty of reasons um, to, to, to use carbon uh, accounting as a lever for improving um, our own uh, business. Mm, and it sounds like just sort of embracing the complexity and, and moving forward anyway. Um, which can be the hardest part, I think. <laughs> Brian, I'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so there's a you know there's a saying, or everybody's heard it, right? How do you eat an elephant, one bite at a time? Um, so in in our group, we talk about you know, okay, it's time to eat the elephant. So I, I would think if I'm looking at say scope three emissions, uh, I think you start by looking at the 15 categories and saying where would you expect to see your biggest impact for us? Agriculture obviously is one. And, and then drill down, follow the math down from there, right? So in all the places where we source, uh, corn and tapioca combined make up 98% of our global sourcing by volume. Okay, I don't need to look at all 220 crops out of the gate. I can look at corn and tapioca. And then where do I source the most, say corn, okay, in the United States? So start boiling it down into manageable bites, if you will. And, and then from there, um, you know, look at what tools are available to you. So, you know, we've conducted uh, life cycle assessments of products. And I think the last one we did was fairly pricey and, and you know, took 10, 11 months to do. And so we've looked for partners like How Good that can help us get that same data at the product level, but accelerate it. And, 
And then, you know, we, we use that to continually refine and clarify the information that we have. I mean, I'll tell you this, we've got a full scope three inventory and, and some of it we feel pretty good about. And some of it we're like, eh, okay. I mean, downstream product usage, it's a guess, right? I mean, we're, we're guessing, making a best guess on that as, as I expect some of our customers are doing as well. Um, but, but I think that's what you have to do is, is you know, follow the math. Same thing as if I said, you've got to reduce your carbon footprint. Well, you're probably going to look at all your operating sites and figure out which one has the biggest carbon footprint. Um, I, I don't think you'd pour all your money into, you know, the site that represents half of a percentage of your total carbon footprint. Um, if there's one out there that represents 30%. Um, and I would say it's the same thing with, with scope three emissions is break it down into manageable pieces, start to refine your data. And when you get far enough along in the process, then you have to figure out, okay, is now is it time to deploy solutions or outside experts or other partners that help me get to the next step that I can't get to myself? Yeah, and I think what you're making me think of in terms of like, you know, having to just like get started one bite at a time. A lot of the companies that are, are starting on this sort of scope through reduction journey most of them are doing it for the first time. Um, and I think that on one hand, we have greenwashing as a real risk that's being recognized by companies um, as something that's to be avoided, not just reputational risk, but also financial risk and now regulatory risk. Um, I'm just curious if you think that this kind of fear of greenwashing is leading to companies maybe not taking as ambitious steps toward um, toward reporting and sustainability goals. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll end the question there. Do you think that's something that's going on? Yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. But then I think, yeah, there are also people who are concerned about greenwashing, so they, so they say less. Um, er, early on in Ingredient, I used to call it iceberg sustainability, because we talked about 10% of what was sticking above the surface of the water. And, and people would chuckle because I'd say oh, iceberg sustainability or, you know, our CEO would say, why, why is our competitor doing this? And did you hear our competitors doing this? And great, we did that four years ago. Well, why aren't we talking about it, right? Um, and, and look, there was a real fear of disclosure for one, is it relevant? And then two, um, it, it, are we greenwashing? Is it good enough? Are we saying things the right way? And, and so I think, you again, you look at how are you being transparent? How are we talking about the information that we share? And are we putting it into context and, and making sure that we're not overstating it? Are we validating the numbers in some way? Uh, but, but at the end of the day, listen, I, I went into our executive team to tell them we need to disclose more and better and, and have that discussion. That was in 2015 or 16. And, and I was supposed to have a half an hour to talk and they were running 25 minutes late and they said, you got five minutes. And I said, I, I don't need to go through the presentation. I can, I can sum this up in, in, a, in a couple sentences. And I said, I, I went to Las Vegas for the weekend and I came home and my wife said, what did you do? And I said, I don't want to talk about it. And I walk out of the room. Is that a good answer or a bad answer? And, and they all kind of laughed. And they said, well, oh, it's a, it a pretty bad answer. And, and I said, how much water did you use last year in Gredeon? And we don't talk about it. Uh, what were your major human rights issues found in Smeta audits? We don't talk about that. Um, it, it's it's about whether or not you're trustworthy enough to tell a story. And do you do your best in making sure that there's integrity in the data and the message that you're telling? Uh, you're never going to please everybody. Somebody's always going to come back and say, oh, you could have said this or that's misleading. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you're making a, a real concerted effort to tell an honest story, I think you will you'll see positive feedback from that. And, and we had customers reach out to us and said, we have those same problems on our human rights audits. Um, here, here's what we've done, or here's some solutions we found. We've gotten much more uptake from telling the bad part of our story than from telling all the good numbers. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. And, and maybe this perspective, yeah, we, we, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that regulation can help uh, both against uh, greenwashing and against understatement um, and, and also going back to the points that we touched at the beginning, the need for standardization. The more we can standardize, the more this will give confidence to every one of us uh, that we are communicating using the same language and the same rules. 
And so I'm also thinking of pre-competitive initiatives that um, have been uh, flourishing over the years. And I hope that uh, I will not see more in the next years, but I will see, we will see some merge uh, over time because uh, again, uh, the more we can find a common language, uh, the more everyone will benefit from uh, the consumer to the farmer uh, along the entire uh, chain. Wonderful. Um, I think this is going to be our last question because we're down to five minutes. Um, and I want to build off of a question in the chat. Thank you, Clint, for putting this to the group. Um, I We've been talking a lot about kind of ramping up that one bite at a time to get to reach sustainability and scope three goals. And I think many companies in the meantime are going to need to buy carbon offsets in, in while they are ramping up those scope three and climate mitigation initiatives. Is that something that Ingredion and Simrise are already doing? And if not, is it something that you're considering? Um, is it something that's talked about? Um, if And are you able to share? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I'll answer from the ingredient side. Um, we're not buying offsets, um, not yet. So I think there's a place for offsets. And and certainly um, if we had a customer that was interested in, in offsetting, we would talk about that with them. But um, for now, we're, we're, you know, we're using science-based target initiative methodology. And they say, you know, once you've got a net zero target, I think it's 10% maximum can be from offsetting, right? The rest has got to be um, somehow in your in your supply chain or, or in your direct operations. And, and so we're seeing that as the bridge to get to the end point, not, not the starting point. Um, we are looking at insetting. So we do regenerative ag projects, measure the soil carbon um, and look at the benefit of that, but it's it's directly with our growers, you know, in our supply chain. And so while we're making that investment in reducing carbon, we're also making an investment in climate resiliency. And that's just we've just started the process from that end rather than from the offsetting end. Thank you so much, Philomena. Well, in our case, uh, we um, we do some offsetting. Uh, it is a very small part because we also look. We also follow the FPTI methodology, the GHG protocol guidance. So, really, um, offsetting is not at the core of our strategy. When we when we uh, talk about our strategy, it is not even mentioned in it. It's just uh, something that um, traditionally uh, was introduced because, again, uh, ten years ago, it was much more. Uh, difficult to deal with these topics. They were new um, and we wanted to do something. So uh, there was a, an attempt to go in that direction, but definitely uh, this is not the core and not what drives us, uh, not what we, um, what we leverage for achieving the goals that are very ambitious for our company. Now we have uh, not only uh, climate uh, neutrality for scope one and two by uh, 2030, we also now have uh, set ourselves a goal for scope three. And for that one, of course, it's all about the supply chain and working with the sites and with um, and with the suppliers to uh, to cut down 30% by um, in the next 10 years. So uh, it's an ambitious one uh, as well. Well, that's ambitious is exactly the kind of goals that we need. So I'm very glad to hear it. Um, Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing uh, all of your experience and strategy. Um, I, I have really enjoyed, genuinely enjoyed our time together today. Um, everyone in our audience, thanks for joining us. Um, please go to our website and sign up for the rest of the innovation series. Um, and you can find Philomena and Brian both on LinkedIn. Um, this uh, video recording will be available on our website, as well as be posting it on our LinkedIn and social media. So if you want to come back to it, please feel free to do so. Um, thank you so much for your time this afternoon, Brian and Philomena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. It was a pleasure. And it will be a pleasure to connect with everyone who would like to continue the conversation. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. And I just uh, am dropping my email address in the uh, in the chat if anybody has questions or wants to reach out. <laughs>